Good morning. Welcome to our first press conference of the day. This one is called Weather's Influence on Earthquakes and Volcanoes. We'll have three speakers in this order. Fabien Albino, he's a postdoctoral researcher at the Ge in geophysics at the Institute of Earth Sciences at the University of Iceland in Reykjavik. Uh, then we'll have Th Thomas Adder will speak. He's a PhD student, also in geophysics in the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena. And our third speaker is Shimon Dalvinsky. Um, he's a research associate professor in the Division of Marine Geology and Geophysics at the Rosenstiel School of Marine and Earth Atmospheric Science at the University of Miami in Florida. So, okay, th thanks for coming. So I'm Fabien Albino. Uh, I did my PhD in France and now moved to Iceland at the Institute of Earth Science. And uh, I'm a geophysicist and focus on the modeling of mechanical interaction between surface loads change uh, and magma storage zone, and especially in, Iceland, uh, in Icelandic volcanoes. Of most, most of them are situated under thick ice cap. And ice cap evolves through times. We can have uh, annual variation due to accumulation in winter and melting in, in summertime. And also uh, ice cap retreats at long term due to the global warming. <coughs> and both changes at the surface cause uh, a low change and from my numerical modeling, I quantify how the stress variation in the crust can affect uh, the magma system of volcanoes. So we can define uh, three different mechanics due to the ice cap uh, unloading. Uh, it can influence the propagation of uh, magma, uh, the failure of a shallow reservoir, and also the production of the magma at deep level. And my research field, uh, I focus only on the shallow parts on the failure of the reservoir. So, if I just move on. This is a, a sketch to illustrate my modeling. So, I have an elastic medium. Uh, and uh, considered as a homogeneous and uh, isotropic. And I model the magma reservoir as an ellipsoid cavity. I apply at the surface an unloading event and calculate the stress change at around the magma reservoir. So one of the applications uh, was in the Katla volcano, situated in South Iceland, under the Myrdajökull ice cap. So it's, Katla volcano is a subglacial caldera with a lot of phreatomagmatic eruption and glacial floats. And the last eruption was in 1918. And why, why this volcano in particular? It's because we have very, uh, uh, very strong surface change for the Mirdai occult ice cap. We have two uh, different type of surface change according to the time scale. First, we have a seasonal effect with uh, accumulation and melting of snow during one year. So you can have a difference of six meters of ice in the center of the ice cap. And you have also a long-term effect more in, at the periphery of the ice cap. 
with a global uh, decrease of thickness about four meters per year. And first, if we just focus on the seasonal load, it's interesting because if you look uh, the eruption occurrence at Katla, you can see that all of the nine uh, last historical eruption occur uh, between May and November, and you have a, a gap of eruption during from December to March, so during the, the winter period. And also in the earthquakes, you can see uh, uh, seasonality of the activity with a gap during the, the winter, ter winter period. So you have an the, the key question that can we have an interaction between uh, seasonal load of the ice cap and eruption and seismicity. So I just I, I don't want to go to the detail in, in the mechanical uh, uh, principle and just here I will give some results if I consider a seasonal unloading at Murdayokotl. I have globally, um, I uh, promote the failure of the magma chamber, means that initiation of magmatic intrusion will be enhanced during the snow melt period and that consistent with the historical eruption. So just uh, some conclusion uh, I obtained during uh, my PhD, it's that the surface load have an effect on shallow reservoir. It depends also on the shape of the magma reservoir and the load distribution at the surface. In case of Katla uh, in South Iceland, the seasonal melting at Murdayokult promote the failure. Uh, and I didn't uh, go to this topic, but we can also uh, take into account viscoelastic behavior when, you, when, you, when we model the long-term effect rather than uh, elastic. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so my name is Thomas. I'm a PhD student at uh, Caltech. Uh, and so with the group, we're looking at the response of the Himalayan seismicity in Nepal to the monsoon. And the goal behind that is to try to understand better how earthquakes nucleate, how you start an earthquake when you, you put a fault under stress. Uh, so here is a cartoon that tries to explain how that works. So that's a cross-section of our field of study, so Nepal. Uh, cross-section is like if you could take a nice slice of the Earth crust, that's what we believe you would see. So what you can see here is that's the Indian plate, and that's the Eurasian plate, that's the Tibetan plateau, that's India, and Nepal is right here. And so those two plates are converging toward each other, so that one is moving that way, and that one is moving that way. And the boundary between the two is that fault, so MHT stands for Main Himalayan Thrust Fault, that's the main fault that we have under uh, the mountains. And so that fault just slips during big earthquakes, the rest of the time it's locked, and so all the energy from the plate convergence is accumulating uh, on that fault as a stress. And that's what those two small red arrows show here, uh, the direction of the shear stress that you have on that fault. Uh, and because of all the stress that accumulates there, you have small earthquakes over there. And that's what we observe. So now how can the monsoon have an impact on that? Um, so here is how it goes. So in the summer, the monsoon happens, it rains a lot and all the water accumulates at the surface of the Indian plate. And actually the load of the water on the Indian plate is enough to bend slightly the Indian plate. So we can observe that with uh, GPS stations that we've put in Nepal. I'm gonna show later in time series. And what you see is all those uh, GPS stations there uh, that are north of where the monsoon accumulates move toward the south because of the bending. And now if you try to understand how that bending is gonna have an impact on 
the stress on the fault. Uh, so those are the two blue rows that you have here. And a nice way to think about it is if you imagine you have a big book and you start bending it in the middle, the pages on the side are going to move like that with respect to each other, right? Uh, and so that's basically what happens here. That fault wants to move that way, so the top frame in that direction and the bottom in that direction if you bend the whole system like that. And so what you can see is the stress that you add up due to the monsoon here is opposite to what uh, the tectonic loading stress is there. So you decrease the stress due to the monsoon here and we observe less earthquakes. I'm going to show that later. In the winter, the opposite happens. So it's not raining anymore. Uh, the, rain ha the water has time to wash away uh, and so the plate unbends. The GPS stations move back to the north and now the stress uh, due to the unbending of the plate adds up with the tectonic loading stress and you have more stress in the fault and then more earthquakes. Uh, so here is a um, time series to show what we're saying. So the top one is I just took a, uh, a GPS station in Nepal and that's the time series of that GPS station and here's the seismicity rate. So it's the number of earthquakes in Nepal per month uh, from 1995 to 2004. And so that's, that just shows again what I was saying before. Uh, in the summer, so under the clouds here, the stations are moving to the south, and you see that usually you have less earthquake than uh, in the winter after that. And in the winter, so that's the red rectangles, the stations are moving to the north, and you see that you have more earthquakes. And so what's interesting with that is that's a very rare way of stressing a fault, having that, that, that periodic loading. Um, because what you want to do if you want to understand how earthquakes work is you're going to create a model uh, that says, let's say I put that stress in the fault, is it going to nucleate an earthquake, is it going to not nucleate earthquake, you want to understand that. So you create a model and then you want to compare it with what you can observe. And uh, in nature you don't have that many examples. You have well, a fault that's just moving steadily, so you have a constant stress and then you see the earthquake that happened there. The, the other stressing con configuration that you, you can have on faults is uh, the aftershocks. So you have a big fault that has a certain earthquake. And so then the stress on all the neighboring fault changes suddenly and all those fault, fault react to that uh, by creating their own small earthquakes. And that's the aftershock sequences. But that's basically it. That's what we have usually to test our models. Here we have a new configuration where you, you take a fault and you actually put a periodic stress on it and see that the seismicity actually responds to that. And that's, that's a very good constraint for us. And actually in Nepal we're even more lucky than, than that because we have two periodic loadings on the fault. So the first one is the one I was explaining, uh, the season variations here. So that's just the stress as a function of time. So you see that it's periodic and the period is about a year. We have another uh, loading that's periodic. It's due to the earth tides, so the, the moon and the sun. We're, we're more familiar with water and ocean tides, but they also deform the crust and that creates stresses on the fault. And it turns out that in our case, those stresses are about the same amplitude for the tides as for what the monsoon does, but the period is really different. It's only half a day or one day, whereas here it's one year. And by the way, here we're talking about really, really tiny stress variations. The, the, the pressure that prevails where earthquakes happen is 500 megapascal for those who are familiar with uh, pressure units. So that means that here we have three kilopascal. We're about a hundred thousandth of the stress that prevails here. And those small variations are apparently enough to trigger seismicity there. And so now if we take the, the stress due to tides and do the same exercise, look at how the seismicity responds to that, we are unable to see any correlation. And so those are to be constrained. The same stressing, same amplitude, different periods, that one doesn't trigger seismicity and that one triggers seismicity. And so we can use that and then put to the test our nucleation models, the ones, the old ones that existed, uh, and refine them and have more parameters. And one of the things that we can learn, for example, uh, is the fact that nucleation of earthquakes is time dependent. It takes time when you put the stress on the fault to create an earthquake. So that we kind of knew before because of aftershocks. Because the way aftershocks work, you know, you, you change the stress on all those faults and then they create their own small earthquake days or months after the earthquakes. That, that, that means that they took time to create their earthquake. But here what's new and what we can learn is actually how long has that nucleation time to be. And here's how. The nucleation has to be longer than the Earth tides period because so the Earth tides period is half a day. 
If there is no correlation, what it means is that you start increasing the stress due to tides, and then the fault starts to want to nucleate an earthquake, but before it has time to actually create the whole earthquake, the stress is back down, and so the, the, the fault is back to square one and does it again, so never really nucleate an earthquake due to tides. So we know that the, the, the characteristic time for earthquake nucleation has to be longer than half a day. On the other hand, we know it has to be short enough to respond to the seasonal variation of stress, which is a year. Uh, and so we know that the, the time of nucleation, at, at least in Nepal, has to be between half a day and a year. And that's a, that adds a lot of constraints on fault parameters uh, and for our models. Good morning, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Shimon Vodovinsky, I'm from the University of Miami. And uh, I'll present uh, a brief summary of uh, our study, study with uh, my colleague uh, Igor Tsukhanov from Florida International University that shows that uh, a very wet tropical cyclones, and tropical cyclone is a generic name for both hurricanes and, and typhoons and cyclones. Uh, all of them are basically the same phenomena, but different part of the world, they call it differently, so the, uh, the name is a cyclone, uh, can trigger earthquakes, and uh, so that's why it's called disaster, trigger disaster, because uh, the cyclone itself is a disaster, there's a lot of flooding, then there are landslides, as we can see in the image here, and then the earthquakes come. Uh, by the way, there is uh, copies of these presentations and the press release that uh, issued by uh, my university at the back of the, the room. So uh, the motivation uh, we started looking in is this uh, uh, issue because we noticed, especially last year, uh, in 2010, there were two earthquakes uh, that uh, occurred uh, within a short time after the same area, it's a tropical area, uh, that was hit by very severe uh, wet uh, cyclones. Uh, last year, there was a Haiti earthquake uh, it probably everybody remembers with uh, many fatalities that occurred in, uh, in Haiti in a mountainous area. And it was 18 months after uh, the same area was hit by uh, a, a four a tropical cyclone, actually two uh, tropical uh, storms and two hurricanes. And then uh, a few months later, there was a, another earthquake in Taiwan, the Kwasing earthquake a magnitude 6.4 that what hit, occurred seven months after the same area was hit by very severe uh, a typhoon Morakot, uh, which uh, had a record uh, rain of uh, 115 inches, which is a huge amount. It's about five times the average rain here in, in San Francisco that occurred in five days. So whatever we get here in one year, they had it in one day over there, over five days. And then Searching uh, so that we uh, found also that uh, there was an earthquake in 99, the Chichi earthquake that had a lot of uh, uh, devastation in Taiwan, and it occurred about three years after uh, Typhoon Herb uh, again had a uh, huge uh, uh, rain. Uh, two, uh, occurred uh, three years prior to the uh, uh, earthquake. Now, so this is the motivation. Now, in order to actually show that. Uh, these relationship uh, exist, uh, went to look at the data set, and uh, since uh, Taiwan has uh, both uh, a lot of severe rain uh, and uh, wet typhoon over there, uh, earthquakes, and very good uh, data records, uh, we looked uh, systematically here in uh, Taiwan, so this is the island of Taiwan, and what we can see over here, these are the uh, location of the earthquakes. The one in uh, green, the magnitude five to six. The one uh, in red, the magnitude six and up. And this is the, uh, the record of the, uh, uh, this earthquake in this region in the mountainous area. Now uh, I can see a peak over here. The peak in uh, around 2000, actually, this is aftershock activity following the Chichi earthquake. It was a large uh, magnitude earthquake, uh, 7.3. So. Uh, uh, we cannot use all of them. We need to actually uh, remove the aftershocks that it won't bias our uh, analysis. And here we see this is the uh, record of the wettest typhoon uh, in Taiwan. 
Uh, they are the 10 wettest typhoon according to the study of uh, Lin and Al. And we can see that uh, there are two that are about uh, two meters of rain, and one which is uh, the Morakot that I mentioned was about three meters of rain, and uh, we'll use that. So basically, we try to compare these two data sets and to see if we can see any uh, relation between the two. And here, this is, after, this is the uh, earthquake in green and red, the uh, occurrence of earthquakes. And the blue are the three uh, wettest uh, typhoon in Taiwan. And now uh, we do a uh, tracking to see how much it happened, uh, what is the delay between. So this is, for example, this uh, uh, red over here. Uh, we calculated it's about 13 years. And uh, we plot it here compared to the uh, amount of maximum rain recorded by uh, each of these uh, events. And uh, for example, here we see this is 3.2, and it plots over here. And uh, when we're looking at this uh, figure, we can see that there is, uh, the red are clustered, uh, located more uh, red, which are magnitude 6 and above, are very close after the uh, uh, wet typhoon. Uh, with the green one, which are the uh, magnitude six, uh, five to six, we, we cannot see any direct uh, correlation. But uh, then we have to, we resort to more uh, uh, statistics, and we did over here. So we put the same information here, uh, but in uh, histogram, in bars, as you can see over here. And you can see that the magnitude six and above uh, uh, occur mostly in the first uh, four years. 85% of the earthquake occurred within the first four years. And we also calculated what would be, what is expected from what we call the background seismicity, what happens uh, over the years. We calculated what is the background seismicity, and we can see that in the first four years, uh, there is 85% uh, of them, and it's five times as expected, uh, and more than expected by the uh, background seismicity. Uh, we did the same analysis for the magnitude five and above, and we see again uh, higher amount of earthquakes right over here, uh, and it's, but it's not as apparent here. It's only 35% uh, of the earthquake occurred in the first four years after the very wet uh, typhoon, and is twice as expected uh, from the background seismicity, but it's still above the uh, background level. Now, uh, why these, uh, I hope I convinced you that uh, there are some uh, relationship between this wet typhoon and uh, the earthquakes that occurred right after the wet typhoon. The question is why, and this is what we uh, suggest. Uh, the main engine that actually uh, responsible for the earthquake is not the wet typhoon. The wet typhoon just determines the timing when the earthquake will actually occur. The main engine is the, is the plate motion, the, the stresses that accumulate due to tectonic uh, plate motion, uh, and we call it tectonic loading. So, and that's horizontal as a plate move one with respect to the other, and they, uh, they accumulate stress on these faults. These are the weak region in the crust that accumulate the stress, and eventually, after the enough stress is accumulated, cannot hold it anymore, they rupture. Uh, now, what happens is that the wet uh, tropical cyclone, uh, they uh, impose uh, or they uh, pour a lot of rain and it caused a rapid erosion. Uh, the, uh, this uh, arrow that shows upward, it's not that it's, uh, they're moving up. Actually, it's moving, the erosion is going downstream. But basically, we remove the load uh, from the, the Earth's surface. So it's called unloading. We, the material is being washed to the, uh, the ocean. And there is less, uh, it's unloading. And as a result, there is a stress change over here at the hypocenter and uh, the earthquake it can be triggered because there is unclamping the fault, there is less stress, and it's easier for the, uh, the fault to move. Uh, and the geometry of the fault, the erosion over here, actually, uh, due to the geometry of the, the fault line, is uh, releasing the, the stress on that, and which enable uh, the uh, uh, triggering or the, the rupture of the earthquake. Now we did uh, some uh, numerical models. Uh, this is uh, some area in uh, Taiwan where there was, uh, this star is an earthquake. The, the line is where the fault. And we calculated uh, using some kind of 
a, it's called the Coulomb stress change and calculated changes in the order after the hurricane of the order of uh, uh, 10 to the, to the 3 or 1 kilopascal. I think it's related to what mentioned before. And uh, such changes are small, but when they're added to the overall uh, changes imposed by the tectonic plate motion, they actually encourage the, uh, a, a, the uh, occurrence of uh, earthquakes. So to summarize, uh, our motivation was that, that we identified three devastating uh, earthquakes with magnitude six and above, and we uh, then uh, found uh, additional earthquakes that occurred in tropical mountainous area shortly after the same area was subjected to heavy rain uh, that imposed by very wet uh, cyclone, uh, whether typhoon or hurricanes. Uh, we used the systematic uh, analysis of data from Taiwan. We looked at uh, magnitude five and above uh, earthquakes in the central mountainous area of Taiwan, and uh, we compared it uh, to uh, the record of the wet typhoon from Taiwan and we found that uh, there is uh, some uh, relations between the occurrence of the earthquakes uh, and the uh, occurrence of the wet typhoon. 85% of the magnitude six and above occurred within the first four years after the wet typhoons, uh, which is uh, five times expected, and 35% of the magnitude uh, five and above uh, uh, also occurred in the first four years. In uh, the model, we use mechanical models to calculate uh, the stress changes after one of the earthquake, and we saw that there is a small stress changes, but uh, apparently uh, big enough to uh, promote uh, the earthquake. Thank you. And uh, we'll open it up for questions. Nick Jones here, uh, freelance, but I'm here for nature. Um, monsoon patterns are expected to change with climate change. Can you speak to how those changes might affect seismicity in these areas? Um, the thing is, we, we're not really sure how they are supposed to change uh, with climate change. Um, well, that would, that would actually be good because we would have different you know, amplitude of stress if they changed. Uh, so now being predictive on what would happen, uh, I don't think we're there yet. Um, we, we might expect that with, with you know, greater stress changes, we would have a, more, a larger variation of seismicity, uh, but until we haven't observed it, it's hard to be really predictive on it. Yeah. I'm Alex Witsi with Science News. I have a related question for Fabian Albino. Um, the reduction in the ice load since 1890 in Iceland, how much of that is linked to rising temperatures and how do you expect that sort of long-term trend of you know, less ice um, to continue? So, um, yeah, your question is about the long-term effect in, 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 the, in the future. Uh, I think, so yeah, the, in Iceland, uh, the ice cap retreat starts in 1890, and so we have uh, a mean of four meter decrease each year, and it's still going on. And in in we in the calculation we we have uh, also performed with viscoelastic um, behavior, and seems it seems that the effect is more than for a previous elastic we calculate. So we have a large effect on on magma storage zone at shallow depth, and also on the magma production. I didn't tell lot of that, but you expect an increase of production of magma at deep level. So you, you have, in, in the future, you will have more magma at deep level to initiate some eruption if the magma go to the surface. So, and the process is still going on. We have some measurements. This question is from Robert Zimmerman from BehindTheBlack.com. He's uh, watching via web streaming. And the question is uh, for both Fabian and Shimon. Are you suggesting these results can be extended beyond these particular locations? And if so, on what basis? And also for Fabian, um, what are the average magnitudes of the earthquakes produced by the ice cap loading? Um, so the, 
So first of all, the magnitude of the earthquakes uh, in the region is very small. It's around two, three of magnitude. Uh, and um, we have a very seasonality in the, in the pattern of earthquakes. Uh, and so for the application in other location, you, you, yeah, you ask? Yes, the other question is um, for both of you. Yeah. Are you suggesting these results can be extended beyond these particular locations? And if so, on what basis? Uh, the result, our results uh, suggest that uh, it can happen in other mountainous area in the tropics uh, where we have it's the seismically active. Uh, so other possible areas, not necessarily in the tropics, but areas that are subjected to uh, uh, cyclones. So such area can be Japan, uh, the Philippines, maybe Central uh, America. So that's something that we plan to explore in the future. Yeah, so just for me, for other location I am thinking. Uh, so in yeah, every location we can have uh, volcano on the ice cap uh, or ice, like uh, in Kapshatka. Uh, but you also need a very strong, uh, you need that the ice cap is very sensitive to the climate change and also to annual changes. So it's the case in Iceland, but uh, I don't know exactly in Kachaka. Rick Lovett, Freelance. Um, this is a two-part question. Uh, first, how statistically significant are your, your correlations? Um, and um, uh, what can, the other part is policy. Uh, can we use this for you know, um, somehow or other reducing risk of, to, to life and property? You know, I mean, can this help us produce warnings or something like that? Well, I think I uh, presented in my study the uh, statistical analysis uh, that shows that uh, the, uh, at least the timing of the earthquake is above that expected. So uh, we, we do take that into consideration. The p value for. Well, it's uh, above, uh, we use different statistics, so it depends what type of statistic you're using. Uh, according to what we show, it's above the, uh, the background seismicity, way above that. And so uh, if, it depends what type of statistic you're using. Uh, but we did uh, take that into consideration, so that's. Uh, and uh, regarding the, uh, about policies, uh, I think it's, uh, too soon to say that, but uh, I think in areas like Taiwan, that's something maybe that uh, where we see with a very strong correlation, that's something that they, they can maybe take into consideration, but it's very hard to, to take that uh, forecast into policies. Yes, yeah, so in, in our case, we don't do a p-value. We do a test that's called the Schuster test. Um, it's a bit hard to explain. You, you take all the, all the time at which we even happen. If you want to test if there is a, a year periodicity, you look at when in the year the earthquakes happen, and so then you take a 2D graph, and for each event, you do like a line of always the same length, and the direction depends on the time uh, within the period where it happens. And so that way you, you make a walk, and what happens is if, if they happen all the time throughout the period, you're gonna end up going back to the beginning. And if there is a periodicity, you're gonna end up far from the origin. And then you can have the probability that uh, you are that far from the origin. So in our case, for the year period, the probability that what we observe is it due only to random is 10 to the minus 14. So it's almost sure. There is another way you can do it. It's just like you take all your earthquakes, you stack them over one year, and you can try just to fit a sine wave, and then you can compare it to the standard deviation that you would have only through random process uh, with the number of earthquakes you have. Uh, that's more just a comparison, but here again you have like way, way higher values. The, the probability would be of the same order of magnitude. Yeah. And then your second question was about the, the, the risk, how, how we can, well we can just tell them that we see more earthquakes in the winter than in the summer. Um, there is not such a big effect so far on the magnitudes that we see, uh, because all the magnitudes that we have are always in the same range, it's like three to five. Um, so it's just like the number of earthquakes that happened rather than so far what we have for the magnitude. So for the, the risk for people, there is no, <clears throat> yeah, no big difference of risk, just more earthquakes at that moment. 
Hi, Stephanie from Live Science, and this question is for Shimon. Um, does the unloading from the typhoons, does it change the magnitude of the quakes versus what would have happened had the fault ruptured, you know, without the influence of the storms? Can you repeat the question? So if, if you weren't having the storms, would the magnitudes of the quakes you'd expect to see on these faults, would they be any different than, you know, the post-storm? Yeah, the, eventually the earthquake will happen uh, regardless if there was a, a erosion, severe erosion or not, because the engine is the tectonic plate motion and probably it would be uh, the same magnitude. Uh, what the, uh, the, the erosion or the unloading determine is the, the timing, when, when the earthquake occurs. Uh, Harvey Leifert, Freelance. Uh, I have a question for, I think it's for Professor Vitovinsky. Uh, it's on the selection of the four years as the significant time period. Uh, how does that come about? It seems there are typhoons every year, more than one a year, and uh, yeah. choosing four years comes from where? Oh. As opposed to three uh -huh. or five or yeah. two? Uh, they, in Taiwan, there are more than one typhoon a year. There's probably maybe three or four. But wet, what we're talking about, wet typhoons. So these are, it doesn't happen every year. I mean, there's, these, uh, I, I showed these, uh, these uh, the statistic of the very, the 10 wettest typhoons. So the very wet typhoons I showed in this example over there, the three wettest, the maybe every 15, over the past uh, 50 years, there were three uh, with uh, a rainfall of uh, about two meters and above. So it's roughly every 15 years, if you say on average, uh, and we see that there's, uh, most of them happens within the earthquake that happens within a year or four years after the, uh, the very wet typhoon. So it's not about any typhoon, it's a very wet typhoon that uh, causes the erosion. But if you chose five years, presumably the number would be even greater. The percent. Yeah, but then your background, your, the assumption about what it's above, it would be greater. Yeah, you'll have all of them every four, four years. But what is expected would be also about four years. So you won't have uh, this distinction between what you see and what is expected, because expected would be every four years. So there is no, uh, you don't see any of this uh, occurrence, uh, concentration of occurrence right after a very wet typhoon. Now, we, we did, uh, there were some, uh, uh, the Marocot, which was the wettest typhoon with about three meters of rain, the, the one I mentioned, uh, there were two earthquakes right uh, after that, magnitude six and above, one after three months and after, one after uh, seven months in two different locations, two different fault systems. And we did some statistics, assuming if it was a random process, what does it mean? And, and we got that if it was a random, if there wasn't any relation with that, uh, to have such two earthquakes, uh, would be only one, it's less than 1% uh, uh, probability that will occur. Uh, and we see that concentration right after this very wet typhoon. So uh, I think it's a good indication that uh, it's related to that. It's a really a follow up from this. It's a question directed at Shimon. Um, sorry, Steve Connor, The Independent. Um, if I've got this right, what you're saying is not the um, typhoon itself that's triggering the um, earthquake, it's the soil erosion. Have you done any analysis of um, areas in the world where there are heavy cyclones but no soil erosion compared to areas where there's heavy cyclones and soil erosion? Now, for example, you've mentioned the Haiti earthquake of 2010. Haiti is renowned for, for being um, a heavily soil eroded place. I just wondered if You've, had, you've done that sort of analysis or not? The, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. If you, if you can uh, focus okay. it. Okay. Um, as I understand, your hypothesis is that it's not the cyclones triggering the earthquake. It's, it's, erosion, a, it's yes. a soil erosion. That's right. Have you done analysis of places where there is soil erosion and places where there isn't soil erosion, but both affected by heavy cyclones? It's, uh, it's very hard to find these uh, locations. I mean, uh, we start looking into that only after we notice these three devastating earthquakes. Uh, you need to have uh, area that is subjected to, that is seismically active, 
uh, is subjected to a lot of erosion, and uh, then you start to look for such a relationship. And we, it's just the beginning of this uh, type of research, and we, uh, so far we identified uh, Taiwan and uh, Haiti, uh, and the, the record is mostly from Taiwan, but we will look into that. So uh, uh, it, at the moment, I don't have any more information about that. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, this question is for Thomas, and it's from Robert Zimmerman from BehindTheBlack.com, and that is, uh, is this a model or actual data at a specific location? And you may have already said that, but he missed it. What, what, is, what is model and what is data? The, the, earthquake, the earthquakes are data, uh, just the number of earthquakes we have. Uh, the stress on the fault is, is, is a model, but it's uh, used on data because we can observe uh, the quantity of water we have on the Earth surface. Um, and so then if we have, that's with, we have a satellite that measures gravity at the surface. So with that, we know where the water is and how much there is. And then with that, if you have a good model of the Earth crust, which we do, uh, you can compute the deformation and then the stress. And we have, um, we have also all the, the stress and the deformations are really uh, correlated tightly. And so we have all the GPS stations in Nepal. And so with that, we can fit all the, all the displacement over there. So we know that the deformation are well modeled. So that's why we, we think that the, the stress is well modeled. But it's like data that we convert with the model into more data. I have another question from Elisa Cheng from the Associated Press, um, and this is for Shimon. This is a follow-up from Rick's question. The U.S. Geological Survey's website says that large low-pressure systems with storms like typhoons and hurricanes are known to trigger fault slip, but it says the numbers are small and not statistically significant. Are you saying otherwise? What? Uh People noticed before, and actually one of the metrologists, uh, not, uh, this name, very prominent uh, metrologist, uh, suggested in 1924 that uh, the low pressure of hurricane can uh, promote earthquakes. And this is what we call dynamic triggering, that the changes occur at the same time when there are a, the, the hurricane or the, the typhoon is suggested because the, the 1923 uh, Kanto earthquake, which uh, destroyed Tokyo, uh, basically occurred when there was a, a typhoon around there. So the low pressure of the typhoon can, according to that uh, suggestion, can uh, actually trigger earthquake. And it was found also uh, a couple of years ago, there was a study by people that in, uh, in, ta in Taiwan found that the slow earthquake can trigger by the low pressure of the typhoon. Now what we suggest is a different mechanism. It's not that it happened during when the typhoon is around, but there is a delay. Uh, and the delay of uh, between three months and three, three and a half years uh, is due to the erosion. We suggest a different mechanism. It's not because of the low pressure system, but because of the erosion, the unloading. So uh, it's a different mechanism and uh, than we suggested have, before. We have time for one more question. Devin Powell from Science News. Um, so both of these monsoon systems in Nepal and Taiwan seem to be looking at relatively similar stress changes. I think you said three kilopascals. You're looking at about one kilopascal. So my question is about the delay. Why are you guys looking at such different time scales than it seems in Nepal you're looking at a seasonal less than a year delay, and in Taiwan you're going all the way out to three years. Is that because of a difference in mechanism, or why, why are the delays different? Well, I can say about uh, the Taiwan or the system that uh, we studied, the delay can be due to different things, but one of them is that the unloading, the erosion, takes time until it's, uh, the material is actually being washed to the ocean. So it's not uh, a one-time event. I mean, you have the, uh, the very wet typhoon uh, that uh, generates a lot of landslides. The material, is, is, some of it is being washed, and some of that can stay around and needs more rain in order to be washed to the uh, uh, to the ocean. Another thing is that uh, the, you need to, to have uh, more additional maybe uh, tectonic forces to accumulate and actually promote that. So it, it helps, but uh, the changes are pretty small and you need an additional uh, loading in order to promote the earthquakes. Great. Thanks for your questions and thanks to our panelists. 
The next press conference will be in here at 9.